Welcome back to Martins and More. My name is Maury Rutsch. And I am Spoon Phillips. And we have a lot to talk about today. What's up, Spoon? Well, it's always a good day when we get to talk about very cool acoustic guitars and occasional acoustic electric guitars. Well, today's episode is a very special one. Our pal Dave requested that we talk about jumbos. And I can't be sure if he's noticed I put on a little bit of holiday pounds or does he just have an affection <laughs> for Martin Guitars designed with an M body and a dreadnought depth? That's the only joke I had prepared. Everything else is going to be on the fly. Regular Bob Hope, this guy. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. Um, the jumbo uh, is a pretty fascinating topic. I'm not sure how many people know about this. I'm sure some of our listeners already know the stories that will be told today. But Chris Martin, C.F. Martin IV, who famously uh, went to a business school and had no intention necessarily of following in uh, his grandfather's and his father's footsteps in working at Martin Guitar. But his grandfather, C.F. Martin III, eventually convinced him. And he did uh, begin by observing and, and doing some work at various stations in the factory to really learn how things were done and eventually had more and more influence in the company. And it's arguable that his first major contribution as a Mr. Martin, um, back before he was CEO, uh, was looking outside of Nazareth, Pennsylvania to the guitar market and what the competition was doing. It's not something Martin was uh, in the habit of doing as a company. And what he saw were jumbos. He saw the popularity of the Gibson Super Jumbo and uh, the popularity of the Guild Jumbo and people who were making similar guitars. And he thought to himself and probably with a panel of other Martin designers, what would a Martin Jumbo be like? And he was the one that said, why don't we just take the Grand Auditorium body size which was signified by the letter M. And later on, they switched it to a quadruple O and then switched it back to an M, but internally it's still a quadruple O body size. And as Mari already said, and just give it a dreadnought depth. I'm sure there was a lot more experimentation behind it, but that's what they came up with. It, they took the M and they made it deeper and suddenly they came up with the jumbo, which does indeed have a jumbo sound to it. And before we go back into the history of the jumbo, why don't we talk a little bit about, are there any jumbos made by Martin today? Well, it's not going to make for good radio, but the answer is going to be short and sweet. There's really only one choice right now when you look at the current catalog of Martin guitars. The only jumbo they currently offer is the J40. That's right. The J40 is a very storied model and that was the very first jumbo um, actually that first year they came out with three models the j21 and i have a friend here in new york city that still owns his j21 i'm not sure it's from the original first year of production but they didn't make the j21 all that long i think they only made it from we're talking 1985 was when they were introduced and i think the j 21 lasted in, into the 90s, so it probably it lasted 9, 10 years, 10 years at the most. And they had the J65, which was maple. And those are very cool guitars. Um, jumbo body, obviously maple is a uh, favorite wood for jumbos. Uh, just about everybody who makes a jumbo or made a jumbo with a big round bottom bout, we're talking the, what Gibson called their super jumbo size, and what, you know, Taylor originally and Goodall and all those people um, and Guild, very common to have uh, maple jumbos. And I think most famously, uh, George Harrison played a Guild jumbo. And I don't remember if he recorded Here Comes the Sun with a Gibson or a Guild, but he's owned both. And I just know he was playing the Guild at Concert for Bangladesh and played Here Comes the Sun on that. So anyway, uh, so Mr. Martin, that's the first time Mr. Martin looked at other people's popular guitars and said, okay, let's try ours. And J65 also lasted into the early 90s. Um, shortly after this, they came out with the JC40. 
And they, around this time, I'm trying to think, we're talking again, like 86, 87, they started coming out with Martin's first cutaways, which was also probably a Chris Martin inspired innovation for Martin. And those cutaways had that, a lot of people have seen those guitars with the oval sound hole. And it was a much deeper cutaway than they use today. So they had to squash the sound hole down and the J, uh, JC40 uh, is a, that's a highly coveted guitar these days from particularly with the oval sound hole because you have a, you have a full access to a 22 fret neck. And, um, and then later on, they got rid of the oval sound holes on the M's and OM's and J's. And there were even some ideas I think might've been made with that design and went with a more typical acoustic guitar cutaway and a 20 fret neck with a normal sound hole. They also came out with the J40 Black, uh, uh, maybe how many years after, probably two years after, three years after the introduction. I'm gonna guess two years after the introduction, they came out with the Black J40. Uh, some people may remember that uh, C.F. Martin III always refused to make black guitars even when John uh, Johnny Cash requested one, and they, it's a true story that they secretly made Johnny Cash his uh, all black D35. And Mr. Martin of the time, uh, Fred Martin, didn't even know about it until he saw Johnny Cash playing it on uh, the Johnny Cash TV show. <laughs> and he was supposedly okay with it. So they came out with the J40 Black. Uh, that was around, uh, they bring it back every so often. Um, so it wasn't that long ago. You can find them on the used market if you love black guitars. I think of, when I think of the J40 and specifically the J40 Black, I think of the Indigo Girls, who for years that was their touring guitars was matching black J40s and uh, really look awesome, uh, of course, on stage. And with, you know, that little bit of pearl that they have, rosette, you know, and the pearl uh, hexagons on the fretboard and all that. So, um, I knew uh, our, our good friend Tony Phillips is a big fan of jumbos and has owned various uh, Martin jumbos. And I like to think of them as sounding like a supersized triple O to me. The jumbo sound to me doesn't have that mid-range trough that you get from a dreadnought. And in some respects, doesn't then sound bassier than a dreadnought because I hear the the notes have more balance across. It's just a lot more vol volume. And they actually make excellent fingerstyle guitars for people who can put up with that, that extra large sound chamber. Let's pause for a moment and listen to a sound sample. This is our friend Tony Phillips and his Martin JC40. Stefan Grossman, his signature model was a jumbo. Uh, there have been a variety of signature models. Can you think of uh, any signature models that were made in jumbos that stand out to you, Maury? The one that I think of first is Diane Ponzio. It's the JDP2, and I'm a little embarrassed, but when I say that, I can't remember what the JDP1 was, but the JDP2 comes to mind as a signature model. And other than that, I don't really know that this model was the basis for that many signatures. More than a couple of times, I think I hit the nail on the head when I do a search for it. I'm thinking of an M 
or I'm thinking of a, a DC. But yeah, the JDP2 Diane Ponzio is the one that's uh, on the forefront of my mind. I'm curious enough now to go look and see, find some YouTubes about that guitar because I remember it being very interesting when I first heard about it. The two guitars are similar. The original John, Diane Ponzio model that I actually got to see with Diane at the factory, first time I met her, and she was showing off the model. It basically looks a lot like a J40. It's got the, the C Martin F abalone headstock and gold tuners. It's got the small uh, style 40 fret markers, the hexagons of rosette, uh, but it's got a three piece rosewood back and it has a, what at the time was a unique sunburst, very jet black on the upper bout and mostly black in the lower bout with what to me always looked like a guitar pick, traditional guitar pick shape to the amber inside inside of it around the bridge. So uh, it was a very stunning looking guitar. Otherwise it was, I'm pretty sure it was, it had the mortise and tenon neck joint, had a micarta bridge. And then the second one, uh, the two, has that really cool wood inlay sun pattern around the rosette that was originally used on the Ian Anderson, the O28 Ian Anderson, I think it was called. That's a uh, very, uh, very cool looking guitar and it had a uh, Italian uh, or some sort of Alpine spruce top. So that was a very cool signature model. I also, another most unusual jumbo signature model was the Buddy Guy, the you know amazing blues guitar player. Uh, look it up, it's uh, quite um, startling because it has this <laughs> like bright, bright turquoise blue inlays, big odd inlays on the fretboard uh, that are off center like kind of hanging off from the side. It's got what looks like turquoise beads, uh, circles as the rosette. Uh, it's a JC, so it's got a cutaway and of, it has electric guitar at volume and tone knobs, like right off of a, a Les Paul or something in, <laughs> in the top. So very interesting, cool, um, acoustic electric, uh, hardcore acoustic electric guitar. And um, it's one of the most traditional looking Martin guitars, said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> said no one ever. That's right. That's right. But when it's been a couple of weeks since we had a trivia question, I thought maybe this week I could ask it, you could answer it. Sure. What do you got? You had mentioned earlier the JC40 from the early 90s had that oval sound hall. My trivia question today to you and all of our listeners, what is the difference in diameter or overall size between the oval sound hall of a JC40 and a traditional sound hall on modern Martins? Let's answer that later. You got it. One thing that's, I found very interesting, speaking of trivia, I have often told people that the JC40 was the only cutaway that they made back in the day. And they actually, in the second year of production, which would have been the 86, they did a short run of JC21s. And uh, 21 was not, you know, back then there was the OM21 was the only 21 out there. And uh, the J21 and the JC21 predate the OM21 by a good number of years. So there's some Martin trivia for you. Oh, wow. They didn't come out with the 28, the, the uh, HJ28. They didn't even come out with that until like right when they were getting rid of the other one. So around 94, I think, was when that showed up. And that lasted into the 21st century the uh, HJ28. But again, these were made in relatively small numbers. Um, they also made them in the, the more affordable uh, series. They, there was a smart wood, if people remember the smart wood uh, gloss top series, there was a, some sort of jumbo in that. I don't remember it's exact, it may have just been called a JSWGT. And then they made a variety of jumbos in, uh, in style 16 and the later 16 series. And the 15s. Oh, yes. And the J15. Yeah, our friend Scooter uh, that we see at Martinfest uh, regularly and, and online has a magnificent J15. Those mahogany tops just age so well. And really, I was really close to ordering a JC15 12 string right when Martin stopped allowing custom orders in the 15s. And it was going to be, you know, it was kind of inspired by Leo Kotke's uh, uh, mahogany jumbo that he was playing in those days. Though so this would have had the mahogany top, and 
And that's the other thing. We didn't even talk about 12 strings. They have made J12 strings that are very popular among 12 string fans. And uh, can you think of anybody that you can remember that plays a Martin Jumbo 12 string? Well, that's an easy one. Marshall Fleischer, my pal from Martin vs. Martin. You can find that program, obviously, on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page Thursdays at 6 p.m. And my most favorite memory of that is this past Martin Fest of this year. Uh, I got to hear that and play that. Really, really great guitar. A uh, great player, no matter what's in his hands, of course, but he really knows how to work his way around that 12 string. And you also mentioned the uh, the 16 series. The first thing that comes to mind very quickly was the very impressive video I saw of Craig Thatcher in the Martin Museum playing the Grand J1216 E. Did I say that right? I don't know. I just work here, <laughs> but th that's a really, really cool instrument. And if you haven't checked that out, uh, find Martin's YouTube or their social media, but Craig plays a really, really great video there. Enough so that it really opened my eyes to how good a 16 series 12 string can sound with a shallow depth. You'll know that everything in the 16 series, even if it's a dreadnought or a jumbo, it doesn't have the dreadnought depth. It has the triple O depth, which is pretty unique. Wow. Well, if you're going to jump the shark all the way to the shallow body Grand J, in the 16 series, I think it's a perfect time to start talking about the Grand Jays. So Martin made their jumbos, basically taking the Grand Auditorium size, the M, and giving it a dreadnought depth. And that became their jumbo. And they do sound unique. They sound like Martin's. They don't sound like anybody else's jumbo out there. So then they came out with the Grand J. And some people may remember that modern Martin jazz guitars came out for a little while there. They came out with modern arch tops. And um, they took that shape and made a flat top of it and called it the Grand J. And they are, they are certainly grand guitars. And they've made a variety of models with them, including baritone guitars. In 2011, they came out with the Grand J28 LSE baritone guitar that looks like a version of style 28. It had a special DTAR pickup system in it, and they're designed to be played uh, with heavier strings tuned to C or even down to B, like true baritones, and or B flat for that matter. And, um, and then around that same time, and I honestly don't remember if that preceded the Pete Seeger signature models or vice versa, but the J12SO they didn't call it a Grand J, so that's why I suspect Pete Seeger might have been earlier than the Grand J 28 LSE. But the Pete Seeger signature model was the Sing Out Magazine 60th anniversary model. For those who are not familiar with Sing Out, it was a, a publication before the internet, primarily about folk music. And Martin has made several different very cool limited edition sing out models over the years, including 12 fret dreadnought and, you know, in various sizes, a very cool uh, sing out model was called a, a triple O. Basically it was a long scale triple O 28, but so it was a, still a triple O because it had, didn't have the quarter inch bracing of a, of a OM. But anyway, the Pete Seeger models, they came out with a six string and a 12 string. Uh, and these are quite unique. They, they're based around his famous 12-string guitar that was built by a, a British guitar maker uh, way back when. So it had a 27 and a half inch scale and it has a 15 fret neck. So you still have 21 frets on it, huh. but it was actually a 15 fret neck. And they're just wonderful, especially when they have the heavier strings. But the 12 string, when you're tuned down into that spooky, gloomy, tone that you can get out of a, a really thick, brothy, rosewood, uh, super sized Martin. And um, so, and I all, I so wanted one, but they were, they, you know, they, they listed back then well over $4,000, which was very expensive at the time. And I would have loved to have had one, but um, those, you know, those are early Grand J's. Other people know the Grand J's because of the CEO models, the CEO eight, that uh, Chris came out with, oh boy, I should know this date, what year this came out, 2013, that's just a guess. But that was Chris's homage to the Gibson Grand Jumbo. And they look a lot like 
uh, the Grand Jumbo, the, 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 you know, design on it. And even the prototypes even said the Martin on the headstock, like some of the 1930s uh, <laughs> Gibsons. And they thought different of it after it. I think it may have even came out at NAM, but the original uh, prototype that I played at the factory said the Martin on it. And I don't know if that was still on there by the time it got to NAM, but by the time they were shipping to the shops, they, they got rid of that and used a, a unique Martin logo. Yeah, a couple of those sneaked into production. And if you're lucky enough to own them, there are probably a dozen people who have that model that have that first headstock design, and that's going to matter later. So hold on to them. Yes, indeed. And and they did a, a, a second uh, CEO 8.2 that I'm trying to remember what what were the differences, but those were uh, I think they I think the, the woods may have been different and it may have been acoustic electric as well, but it was slight, slightly different, but still a Grand J size. Uh, the Grand J the, and the very first regular production non baritone and maybe the first Grand J of them all was the uh, Grand J 35 three piece back. And I know, uh, you know, I know those were, they didn't make a lot of them, but they, uh, the people who have them certainly love them. So um, the Grand Jays went on to uh, do other 12 strings. And right now, uh, as Mari pointed out, there is the shallow body, the triple O body depth, uh, Grand J 12 string in the 16 series, which definitely has a different sound. You don't get that big wallowy bottom end that you would get from the deeper body, but it's, uh, it's much more balanced and, and shimmery sounding. And I think the reason they go with the shallow bodies in the 16 series, they're made specifically for, for performing musicians and having the shallower body really reduces feedback when you're playing in a large auditorium through those giant PA systems. That's really what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned, but um, they also comfort. They, they their selling point, as far as Martin is concerned, is the shallower depth on the Dreadnought and the Grand J. It just makes it much easier to play, particularly for people who are not really large people. So we've had a lot of jumbos over the years. They come and go, cutaways, oval sound hole, acoustic electrics, in almost every series and size. Uh, and then Grand Jays as well. And uh, they will continue to put them out. Uh, they keep the J40 in the lineup, as uh, Chris Martin told me, as a legacy model. Same reason they keep the M36. They want to have at least, at least those important models, you know, in the catalog for people who, you know, want to buy those body sizes, even though the other M's and J's come and go. So, uh, so very cool. I, I look forward to uh, reading the comments in the YouTube version of this podcast to see uh, who owns and loves their jumbo or grand jumbo. And of course, mentioning any other cool signature models or favorite models that use those body sizes. We'd love to hear from you. Well, my spidey senses are tingling, and our friend Jack Wickwire in Maryland is asking us, why didn't you talk about the J41 special yet? Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Mari. Thank you so much for the J41 <laughs> special. Martin had come out with some 41 special models here and there. And if I remember, the J41 special has a, uh, a V-neck on it, I think. Does that sound right to yep. you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's got a, a V-neck from the, like, the Vintage series. They didn't actually make they didn't make those kind of guitars back in the days of V-Nex in the 1930s, but they uh, they used what's basically vintage series specs, similar to the Triple O 41. They didn't make trip they didn't make Triple O 41s back in the day, so they weren't part of the vintage series. But it basically was a the Clapton model with style 41 appointments, and then they then they came out with the J uh, you know jumbo version of that. So thank you for uh, for pointing that out because that was a really cool model. Absolutely. And I know a lot of you guys might be thinking that this has been a cool episode, but there really aren't that many jumbos to pick from, especially in modern day. If you look around the Martin catalog, there's really nothing to pick from except the J40. And I can't go on record to say why Martin doesn't offer more jumbos, but as an authorized dealer, I can certainly tell you we think there needs to be more. And that brings us into a real quick segment I want to call Custom Shop Jumbos. Those of you guys that aren't unfamiliar with Maury'sMusic.com, you'll know that we offer a J28, 
a J28 Adirondack, and a J28 Adirondack VTS. And I use those as nicknames. They're not really called J28, but we have taken the OM28 and built it in a jumbo size. And long story short, it's not necessarily the herringbone version of a J40, but to serve that purpose, we do know a lot of people like the J40 sound and either don't want that cost or they don't want to get into Pearl. If you look into the J28 style guitars that we offer through the custom shop, you're getting quarter inch braced, jumbo sized Adirondack tops, Sitka tops, and VTS Adirondack tops. And depending on what level of gigantic, powerful tank you want in a guitar, some of those guitars are just seriously loud, clear, uh, very defined. It, it's not volume for volume's sake, but there are some really good reasons to look at the custom versions of jumbo guitars on our website if the J40 is almost what you want, but you like the herringbone look. And uh, you mentioned the quarter inch bracing. As far as I'm concerned, the quarter inch bracing supercharges large tops. So you get extra reverb and the, a much more OM like go out and fill the room. I said at the beginning of the program, to me, that jumbo's sound, typically like a J40, is like a supersized triple O. The, the notes are very focused and stay together and come out in like a big punch, They're very punchy sounding when you play them with a the pick and stuff, where that quarter inch scallop bracing really opens up the voice as well as uh, adding uh, the extra reverberation. And uh, again, quarter inch or five sixteenth inch bracing, wonderful finger picking guitars. And, uh, you know, quite versatile at the jumbos have their own sound, grand J's have their own sound. So it's definitely a nice alternative to dreadnoughts when it comes to big bodies. So how about that trivia question? How about it? We asked you earlier, what is the difference in the size of the oval sound hole on the early nineties JC 40? versus the traditional size sound hole on most modern Martin guitars. Spoon, are you ready to bring us our answer? None whatsoever when it comes to the area of the sound hole. I asked this a long time ago uh, when I was hanging out with Tim Teal and Mike Dickinson, because I have an oval sound hole, triple O 16, that I absolutely love. And they said that they basically just made it narrower and a little longer, but it has the exact same area. So you're still, uh, you're still getting the same size sound hole in terms of the empty space. Interesting. That's pretty cool. I agree. Martin, of course, has decades upon decades of experience with this stuff. And it's interesting how, how they decided to make the sound holes the size they are, because the double O sound hole is a little smaller than the triple O sound hole, and the O sound hole is a little smaller than the double O sound hole. Uh, there's certainly guitars uh, out in the world that have the same body sizes that have smaller or larger sound holes. And Martin has uh, dealt with this with, uh, with the signature model that has the body of a triple O, but a 12 fret neck and a double O size sound hole which is Norman Blake's signature models. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you know, he feels that it adds, you know, changes the sound. And I'm not exactly sure. I know there's some debate about it is, does that make the sound bassier? Does it make it louder? Which seems counterproductive because it's a smaller sound hole. But Norman Blake uh, definitely believed that it mattered to have a slightly smaller sound hole to go along with his 12 fret neck. I always thought that was fascinating and that Martin would do that. But, but the answer is, it doesn't matter whether you're in an M or a J or an OM or a triple O, anything that had the oval sound hole, the oval sound hole and the round sound hole were the same size in terms of the area of the top that has been removed. Well, that was a fun trivia question. And I just knew you would know the answer. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I am here at Martin's and more on a very regular basis. <laughs> yeah. So please send in your questions. If you guys have interesting trivia questions, things that you think would be an interesting trivia question, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we'd love to hear from Dave again. Dave, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. It certainly was a fun episode and a great topic to talk about. I can't tell if I'm hearing an oval sound hole 
or around Sound Hall, but I hear acoustic music in the distance. We're almost out of time. I want to thank you, Spoon, for another great hour of cool conversation. I want to thank all of our loyal listeners for hanging around with us and invite you guys to listen again next week where we undoubtedly have a great topic that we have not picked yet, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. From all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. <laughs>